consider this genealogical tree, and I'm going to label it in a very special fashion. It's called a breath-first fashion, giving rise to breath-first walks and breath-first labelings and breath-first whatever you want. So what is this breath-first labeling? So I start with the first individual and give it the number one. Then I go through its offspring and give it successive numbers, two, three, four, et cetera. Then I go through the offspring of the offspring and then again assign them successive labels in such a way that, for example, so five comes before seven, so all the labels that I give to the descendants of five have to be less than the labels I, I give to the descendants of seven. So that's basically the rule that specifies breadth-first labeling. So now that we have the, true, the, the tree with these labels, I'm going to define the breadth-first walk. So that's going to be defined through its increments. So I'm going to let delta x of i be the quantity of children of individual i minus 1. You'll see the minus 1 appear in a bit. Just bear with me for a while. We're going to define also x of 0 equal to 0. And of course, x of i is just going to be the sum of the increments delta x1 up to de delta xi. So for example, in this stream, you see that, that delta x1 is equal to 2. Delta x2 is minus 1. Delta x3 is 2. Delta x4 is minus 1, etc. So I wrote them up here. And now the, the breadth first walk is obtained by starting at 0 and summing up these values as they appear. So we get this. And we get this kind of wiggly function that's to your right. So these functions are called either Lukachevic paths or just the breadth first walks. And they satisfy the following. They have jumps of size greater than minus 1. They are non-negative until we re reach the last value, which is equal to minus 1. So we call, call, call these kinds of paths excursions. Uh, so they start at 0 and at, the end at minus 1, uh, remaining above 0 during the whole trajectory. So um, I'm going to explain uh, a very nice relationship between uh, the sequence of generation sizes in the tree, which is what I initially told you that I was going to be interested in, and the breadth first walk on the tree. So again, we let chi of phi be the quantity of children of individual i. So this is the, like our delta x i, except that it has a, a plus one. It doesn't have the minus one. And suppose we want to count the number of individuals up to generation n, right? So this is 1 at generation 0, 4, uh, 7, 11, etc. So all individuals up to generation n either are, well, the initial individual or descend, descend from somebody up to generation n minus 1, right? So if I will count all of the, all of the individuals up to generation n, if I sum all of the offspring of individuals up to generation n minus 1 and the initial individuals. So we're not really interested in, of, uh, in Cn, but rather in the differences Cn minus Cn minus 1, which give us the successive generation sizes. So I'm going to subtract Cn from this bit, and I could just do it by subtracting 1 from each one of the chi's. And that's where the minus 1 from the last slide come in, comes in. So that's, so I, I did the subtraction here, and what I get is that the quantity of individuals at generation n is equal to, to the quantity of initial individuals plus the breadth first walk at time cn minus 1. So this gives us a recursive procedure to compute from the breadth first walk uh, the sequence of generation sizes. And just uh, to give you a taste of what's uh, coming afterwards, if we did this in continuous time, uh, the analog of this would be as a, a differential equation that would be written like this. So x would be kind of like the continuum analog of a breadth first walk. Uh, this would be the cumulative population, and this would be the, you know, generation sizes. So in the case of Galton-Watson processes, so I'm interested in the sequence of generation sizes, and what I just said was that you would obtain them by summing up, by constructing this breadth-first walk, which is a sum of 
you know, the quantity of offspring that individuals have. But what we said at the beginning was what, that these quantities of offspring are independent random variables. So what I'm saying is that this x of n is going to be the sum of n independent and identically distributed random variable. So that xn becomes what's known as a random walk. So uh, one thing that comes out from all of this analysis that we've just made is that if I start with a random walk and solve this stochastic recursion, I would end up with a Galton-Watson process. And this is just a picture of what uh, it could look like. So here I drew a tree, uh, then I have the breadth first walk, and then solving this recursion, I get uh, the sequence of generation sizes, which is as should be one, three, one, three, three, two, one. So that's correct, and we're good. So let me now uh, go back to the tree thing. Oh, but before that, I have to tell you how to, how to do this with continuous parameters, stochastic processes. <coughs> so again, I told you that a random walk is just a sum of independent and identically distributed random variables. But when they come from trees, they're very special in that all of these increments are greater than or equal to minus one. So they're a very special kind of random walks. They're called skip free to the left, or just skip free. And one thing one could do with these walks is kind of to construct a continuous time stochastic process is to scale them. You see, I can run the, the, the random walk for n steps, but do it in one unit of time. And then if I just try to do that on the computer, it won't be able to graph anything because this xn might just grow too much. So what I need is to do some scaling, and it turns out that this is the correct scaling for uh, many offspring distributions, uh, and this is what's called the scaling of the random walk. A scaling limit is a limit of this, so this is kind of a random wiggly function, right? Uh, and I can take the limit as n goes to infinity, to obtain something, and that something is called, well, in this case, Brownian motion, or in the more general case of having not only one random walk, but actually a sequence of random walks, I would get any possible uh, Levy process that has no negative jumps. So at this point, uh, I think we need some pictures because probably nobody has seen a Levy process before, right? I see some people lying, huh? <laughs> Good, so let's put some pictures of Levy processes. So here's one. Um, we have to wait till it stops. So I showed you approximations to a Levy process and this is what, it con what this approximations converge to. So it's these kind of wiggly random functions with discontinuities all over the place. Uh, so, you might think that they're very complicated because the offspring, so the, 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 the distribution of these random variables is just completely general, right? So you, you, you might think that there's no hope of describing all Levy processes, but actually you can describe them. And you can, can describe them uh, in terms of what's called the Laplace exponent. So we have completely determined all the possible Laplace exponents that can appear and I'll show you the formula afterwards. Uh, but what I want to say here is that this Laplace transform, this Laplace exponent is very similar to the generating function of Galton-Watson processes that I showed you before. In the sense that it's convex, and it might look a bit like this, and that we're also going to be very interested in the greatest root now of this convex function. We'll get to that, hopefully. Just as I did scaling, oh, I might, might um, no, I won't. Uh, just as, as we did scaling limits for random walks, one could do scaling limits for Galton-Watson processes. So these scaling limits are now very easy to obtain once 
we know that there are scaling limits for the random walks. Why? Because we have a way of constructing the Galton-Watson process out of the random walk by solving this recursion. So what, one, what comes uh, out of that analysis is that the scaling limits of Galton-Watson processes are called, well, we call them continuous branching processes, their name, uh, and they solve this random ordinary differential equation. So why did I, do, did I call it a random differential equation? Well, because this is a random function, right? Once you fix that function, then you just have a differential equation to solve. Except that it's a very complicated kind of differential equation because remember that for most Levy processes, uh, the set of discontinuities is dense, right? So it's a really discontinuous function. So you might think that there's no hope ever of solving this equation, but it turns out that, well, well that's what we did here. And uh, yes, one can not only show that solutions exist and are unique under some conditions, but also that if you apply, you know, the most naive method you can think of, of for solving a differential equation, and that would be Euler's method, right? It converges. Even though this has a dense set of discontinuities. So these uh, continuous branching processes are also kind of determined by a Laplace type exponent, except that now the, the, the dependence on T is very complicated, and this Laplace exponent solves another differential equation where you see the Laplace exponent of the Levy process appear. Right? So here's the Levy process and the branching process. Here it's the, the Laplace uh, exponent of the Levy process, and here you have kind of the Laplace exponent of the branching process. So very well, we can now uh, understand that um, there's kind of scaling limits for these Galton uh, Watson processes, and that might make us think that there are also limits for the random uh, genealogical trees uh, that we can build from Galton-Watson processes. So that is correct, and that was actually proved by Aldous in uh, 19, well, in the sequence of papers between 1991 and 1993, we call it the Continuum Random Tree Trilogy. And uh, so the, the statement of the result is as follows. You are going to fix a technical condition, don't read it, uh, distribution uh, for the offspring, uh, you're going to assume that it is critical. It means that the population becomes extinct with probability one. And that it has this finite variance condition. Don't worry too much about it. It's uh, very generic and interesting things happen when it's not satisfied. And you, def you define now tau n to be a Galton-Watson tree, but you're going to force it to have n vertices, right? So you're going to, you know, throw your dice and see your, the, your uh, population evolve until you see one of those family trees that becomes extinct exactly when it has n individuals. So that's your Galton-Watson tree condition to have n vertices. And remember that I told you that a tr you can think of a tree as a, as a metric space. So here's the distance in that metric space. And what you're going to do is you're going to alter the distance by dividing it over the square root of the number of individuals. And now you're going to take a limit of this metric space. So there's a whole theory uh, that tells you how to deal with limits of metric spaces, and so weak limits of random metric spaces. Uh, and that converges to a, con to a real tree, to a random real tree that has the name of continuum random tree, or just CRT, and we typically call it Aldous CRT. So in order to get an idea of how this continuous random tree looks like, uh, remember that we had this concept of the tree coded by a function, right? So we're going to code a tree by a random function, and it is this random function, which is called the normalized Brownian excursion. So the continuum random tree is the tree coded by the normalized Brownian excursion. And uh, just so that you get an idea of how another Levy process looks like, here's the normalized Brownian excursion, and we get it out of a process called Brownian motion, which is the one I wrote here, which is the, your prototypical continuous Levy process. So it's a Levy process which is not discontinuous all the time. Um, and so this, it looks a bit like this. And to construct a normalized Brownian excursion, you're going to fix a deterministic time. 
you know that Brownian motion is not going to be zero at that deterministic time, so you define the last zero and the first zero before that deterministic time. So that gives you a, an interval at which Brownian motion is not zero. Now you take absolute value of that and you kind of shift things a bit so that it's defined on zero, one, and you have the correct spatial scaling, and that's called the normalized Brownian excursion. So in summary, the normalized Brownian motion through the normalized Brownian excursion gives you access to the most famous continuum random tree or random real tree. Now we're going to pass to a chronological model on trees. So this is a, a model called the splitting tree model. And in this model, time will be continuous. So now, what, what is a chronology and how it differs from a genealogy? Well, in a genealogy, we have no notion of time. You know, we have individuals and their offspring. They, they, they define the successive generations. But in, chronolo in chronologies, I have to, to specify, besides all these genealogical structure, what are the birth and the death times of each one of the individuals? And at what time do the offspring uh, uh, appear in the population? So our model considers uh, uh, this chronological aspects as follows. We're going to consider a population in which individuals live for a certain lifetime. It's going to be random. During which they reproduce, right? So along, the, so here I represent the lifetimes as vertical uh, segments, and so time flows upwards. And along these uh, lifetimes, there's going to be moments at which the individual just reproduces. At each reproduction event, only one offspring will come to life here. And this is done at constant rate throughout the whole lifetime. So yeah, a constant rate is a phrase that means, uh, that is very clear for probabilists, but maybe it's not clear for the rest of the population. And, it, uh, and it's hard to explain. So one way to explain it is to say that on any given interval, there will be a random number of individuals. And once I fix that random number, say it was equal to three for this, then I will place the birth times uniformly on this segment. Three of them, right? Good, so that's a trait, okay, so at, and you know, the probability that case equals three depends on this lambda, which is the Oh, no, that's constant rate B, right? So it depends on the birth rate. So we're going to assume, again, that the lifetimes of different individuals are just independent. Uh, so everything is independent of everything else in this uh, population. So it gives uh, rise to these kind of uh, pictures where you know I have uh, vertical lines representing uh, lifetimes and the horizontal dashed lines just give us a, sen a, a sense of descendants, right? So this, this individual, represented by its lifetime, descends from this other individual, right? Good. So one thing that's interesting about this uh, model is that one has a genealogy and a chronology. So the genealogy, how do, how do I get, for example, the generation of this individual? Well, I just need to see how many times I have to uh, kind of, uh, go through these dashed lines. So here there's one, two, and then three. So the generation of this individual is three. So there's a genealogy embedded in this, in this, in this model. Good, so, and since there's a genealogy, we have several notions of branching processes that we can consider. For example, we could consider the quantity of individuals that are alive at a given time t. So I fix a time t, and I just count how many individuals. So for example, here there's only one, here there's two, uh, here there's like five, etc. We could have another branching process, which is just the size of the nth generation. And that turns out to be, in this splitting tree model, a Galton-Watson process. And then there's a third one that I won't worry too much about. So there's a very particular case that's very dear to uh, probabilists and uh, nuclear scientists, and that's called the Yule process. And it is a, a model in which individuals just live forever. Why not? And so 
we have this first individual, lives forever, and at constant rate, you get its descendants. And now the first branching process, so that's the quantity of individuals alive at time t, it's what's called the Yule process, and it, you know, we can, one can make some, a whole bunch of explicit computations with this process, it's a, it's a very well-known uh, stochastic process. But we're interested in the general ones where this lifetime is random rather than deterministic as in here. So using the Galton-Watson process that's embedded in this population model, one can actually deduce from you know, the Galton-Watson analysis of uh, extinction that these genealogical or chronological trees are finite almost surely if and only if uh, this parameter m, which is equal to the birth rate time the mean times the mean lifetime, is either less than or to one in the subcritical case or equal to one in the critical case, case. In the supercritical case, there is positive probability that these trees will just be infinite, will go on forever. So I'll explain now a way in which one can explore this tree in order to get a Levy process or a Levy type process. So one is going to explore all the lifetimes of all the individuals starting with the initial individual of the population. And lifetimes will be explored from top to bottom. So we start exploring the lifetime, and then suddenly we will get interrupted by this birth event. And when we're interrupted by a birth event, we just go to the top of the lifetime of the individual that was born. So here we go again. We jump to the top of a lifetime, jump to the top of a lifetime. And then when we, uh, when we reach a moment where we haven't been interrupted and we reached a birth time, then we just go back to the lifetime of the parent where we left off. So that gives, gives you a way of exploring the tree. And if you now record the time that you're exploring, so as you go uh, doing this uh, uh, exploration on the tree, then you get a function. And the function looks a bit like these uh, uh, segments here. So let me erase the, well, first the genealogy that's in, uh, 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 that was on the tree. Then I'll erase the vertical jumps. And this is the type of uh, function that you end up with. So it's a function, as in the beginning, that starts at a non, that is non-negative. It has only positive jumps, because I always jump to the top of a lifetime. And it ends at zero. So it codes a tree. And the thing is, the tree coded by this function is exactly giving us all of the information of the chronology in the model that we introduced. So what Lambert proved in 2010 was that in the subcritical case, this random function, which is called the contour of the tree, is a special type of Levy process. So it's a, an uncrazy type of Levy process in which actually it's piecewise linear and it doesn't uh, have dense jumps. You know, it's a very nice controlled process. So these are called compound Poisson processes, and they're completely specified by their uh, jump distribution and jump rate and whatnot. Except that, you know, this kind of Levy process, you would, you would just be able to let it go on forever, but uh, to get a tree, we need to stop it at the time at which it first reaches zero, which is over here. So I've now I've kind of done the reverse procedure. So I had a chronological model of, on, on trees and then constructed random processes with that. And the question that we had uh, uh, in our joint work with Amory Lambert was how one would be able to obtain not only these types of very simple AV processes, but you know, Brownian motion or stable processes, or those really crazy types of AV processes. Um, however, Lambert also had another result that was also a motivation for us, and that is that in the supercritical case, so for example in the Yule tree case, the contour of a splitting tree, well, it's no longer defined. We needed a, a finite tree to be able to do the contour, to be able to jump to the top of the lifetime. 
And uh, the way to associate uh, a contour to these kind of infinite trees is to choose a truncation time. So I just chose it here, call it R if you want. And then forget everything that happens after time R, and that gives you a uh, now finite tree to which you can uh, associate a contour that looks a bit like that. And what uh, Lambert proved now is that the con in the supercritical case, the contour of a splitting tree truncated at height R is another compound Poisson process, but now it's going to be reflected. So reflection in um, this setting can be constructed as follows. So we have a function here, x, this is our Levy process, r, so it starts at a positive value, goes crazy for a while, and then, well, the typical Levy process will go above a height r, and then maybe zero, and what we're going to do to reflect it is to erase all of the bits of the trajectory that are above level r. We do this through what's called the techniques of time change, and that's uh, done by defining first a t of r to be the quantity of time that the process has spent above time r. And then, you know, this is a continuous uh, non-decreasing function which might have intervals of constancy or whatnot. And what we're going to do now is to construct what's called the generalized inverse, which just needs you to, you know, shift your head and see this as a function now uh, defined on this interval. And whenever you see an interval of constancy, it means that this function jumped. And then we uh, define x of r to be x of c of r. And that effectively removes all of these parts of the trajectory where the process is above uh, level r. So that's how you construct a uh, Levy process reflected below level r. So that um, gives us access to supercritical splitting trees and Levy processes. Good. So now I'm going to tell you how to do all of these things with a general Levy process. And that goes through the uh, excursion measure, which I'm going to define right now. So remember that Levy processes are characterized by their Laplace exponent. And now I have written the formula of what they look like. So it's basically a very simple function plus a totally inaccessible one. You see, so here you had some quadratic terms, linear terms, and, you know, independent terms. And here you have a measure. And this measure is telling you how your process, your Levy process will jump. So if this is an infinite measure, your Levy process will just jump all the time. It will have dense jumps. Uh, whereas if this is zero, then your Levy process will be continuous and it'll be basically a Brownian motion with drift and killed at a certain rate. So now I'm with any, so with any Levy process that might look a bit like this, I'm going to define the reflected Levy process. How? By first constructing the cumulative minimum process. So here's the cumulative minimum. You see this, you know, I'm, I'm constructing the minimum as I go along, the minimum value I've observed as I go along. And then I'm going to subtract the value of the process from this cumulative minimum. So that looks like that. And then we change it. And this is out of the original Levy process that I had, I constructed a new Markov process that looks a bit like this. Good. So that's the reflected Levy process. And now I'm going to construct its excursion measure. Well, this is a very kind of complicated type of random process because it kind of has these excursions above level zero, except that one thing I haven't told you about that is that if you consider the set of times such that this reflected process is at zero, then, and you close it, then this is a perfect set. So, yeah, this is one way in which probabilists like to construct a random perfect set using the zero set of their favorite stochastic process. What that means in terms of these excursions is that they're not like clearly delineated as I said here. There's no next excursion. 
right? Between any two excursions, there'll be an infinite number of excursions, right? So we can order them. And so one way in which have, we have found a way to, 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 to study them is through what's called the excursion measure. And that's just simply a sigma finite measure mu, such that uh, if we consider for this process only the excursions of length greater than epsilon n, there's only a finite number of them on any compact interval. Uh, their distribution, we call it, we call the mu of n. Then this measure mu encodes all the measures mu of n. So this measure mu is a sigma finite measure on trajectories that are of the excursion type. So they start at zero, typically they might start at a non-negative value and end at zero. So it's the kind of functions that we love for constructing trees. And so in the case where our Levy process x is uh, subcritical, and that means this function here has b equals zero, then we will associate to it a random real tree that is the tree coded by x under the excursion measure n. And that's one way in which we can associate to any Levy process these uh, random trees, random real trees. So, Mm, this, you don't really need to look at it, do you? No, oh well, yes, because I have to tell you how you do this construction in the supercritical case, and that's actually pretty, a bit complicated. So what you're, in your supercritical case, the thing is that your stochastic process X will infinity, and so there's one excursion of infinite length, right? So the excursion measure can actually be decomposed as its action on uh, finite excursions and uh, its action on infinite excursions. And the infinite excursion bit here, this is a probability measure that is equal to the law of the post-minimum process of your linear process. So that's what this excursion measure is. But we need something else in, it in order to be able to construct a locally compact real tree and that is a sequence, actually, of excursion, of compatible excursion measures. So I'll just briefly go through that. So let me tell you how you can construct locally compact, forget the Tom thing here, uh, locally compact trees out of now sequences of functions. So imagine you had a tree. It's locally compact. It's infinite. But you truncate it at level R, so it's now a compact tree. It has a contour, that's f of r. And these contours are, well, okay, so either the trees are compatible under truncation or the functions are compatible under time changes. And we say that that happens when, you know, you, you fix your sequence of levels going to infinity at which you truncate, and then when you truncate at level r of n, the, the, the tree that was truncated at level Rn plus 1, then it gives you back the level, the, the tree truncated at level R of n. So if you have a sequence of trees that is compatible under truncation, then you can construct a unique locally compact tree such that truncating it at level R of n gives you your nth tree in the sequence. And that's how you construct a locally compact tree out of a sequence of compact trees. You can do that the same at the level of functions. So now I need to do that at the level of random functions. And that's what the next uh, slide should be about. But it's not. So I'll just tell you how you construct it. You need to define a sequence of measures that is compatible under time change. And that's going to be the measures N of R. And they're going to be constructed as follows. So first. On the compact, on, the, on compact trees, I just truncate them at level R. And to get uh, the action on, on the locally compact uh, part of 
tree space, then what I do is I'm going to define this new law, p right arrow r, which is constructed as follows. So first we'll have the post-minimum process, uh, process of a Levy process, time changed to remain below r, so reflected below level r. This will have a finite lifetime, so we'll, because the process will drift to infinity. And at this point, we're going to uh, paste some other Levy processes that are also reflected under time r, and which might also have a finite lifetime. And we're going to keep on doing that until one of these processes reaches zero. So this is now a function that's defined on trees that are truncated at level r. And one can prove that this sequence of functions is compatible under uh, truncation so that one can define a unique measure n on locally compact trees such that truncating the tree, the locally compact tree at level r, we get precisely this measure n of r. So that's how you construct uh, locally compact trees associated to any Levy process. But finally, I'm going to state a very, uh, it's a nice theorem, uh, but it's slightly technical. And it has to do with the genealogy that is encoded by these types of chronologies. So uh, I'll just say then that for these types of trees that we just constructed, one can build a genealogical tree by a very complicated construction involving what probabilists call uh, local time. Uh, so we can do that. That's what's said here. And then on this locally compact tree, now we have a locally compact tree, we have a notion of infinite lines of descent. So if you have a tree, an infinite line of descent will be a, an, isom an isometry from an infinite interval into your tree, right? So that's an infinite line of descent. And so here's, uh, uh, we represented a tree with infinite lines of descent and some compact trees that are grafted to this infinite line of descent. So under our measure on genealogical trees, one can define the process that counts the number of individuals that are sitting at an infinite line of descent at distance a from the root. So if this is distance a from the root, we'll see that here I think we have five uh, uh, infinite lines of descent whereas here we have only one infinite line of descent. So this process turns out to be a Galton-Watson process. So we just came back to where we started. We can compute explicitly its jump distribution and jump rate. So this is these horrible looking expressions. But the thing to note about them is that they're completely determined by the same quantities that determine your Levy process. And finally, that there's a version of the counting process for non-prolific individuals. And that, you know, counting process is not really a counting process. It's a rather Nicodem derivative, but don't worry about all that. There's a, a way to define this uh, of measuring non-prolific individuals. And it turns out that just as for supercritical Galton-Watson trees, the couple of process Z1 and Z2 is a two-type branching process that can be completely specified. And I think I'll end with that. Beautiful formulae that completely specify this two-type branching process in terms of three Levy processes that govern the reproduction of prolific individuals, uh, giving rise to prolific individuals, the reproduction of prolific individuals giving rise to non-prolific individuals, and the reproduction dynamics of non-prolific individuals. Uh, thank you very much. He said thank you. <laughs>
Yes, so sorry, I uh, probably compiled the wrong version of the bibliography. <laughs> it just appeared. <laughs>